welcome back to the second part of our Chime 2 course today. Um, yeah, we went through a lot of different concepts already in the first part. Um, and the last thing we talked about were the ecological diversity metrics and, you know, how to compare them and calculate them. So, like, now is a good point to actually, you know, uh, go back to the notebook and run them. So we can switch to the notebook again, um, which hopefully should still be there for you. If not, you can also just rerun all the previous cells. Um, and one good thing is that for Chime 2, we have basically a plugin that can actually generate a lot of different diversity metrics at once and generate a lot of different artifacts, kind of similar to the data 2 um, input. So um, the one that we were looking at is the core metrics phylogenetic um, diversity plug in action. Um, and as an input, it basically takes the abundance table generated by data2. So the abundance table in data2 basically had the counts for each individual ASV sequence. Um, and that we will be using um, for all the comparisons. We do input also the phylogenetic tree that we generated from the multiple sequence alignment. So we can use like uh, metrics like Unifrac. Um, and we do something called like we specify sampling depths, which is a bit odd. So um, why won't we want to do that? And it has to do something a little bit with normalization. So what we did see initially is that across each samples, we had fairly different numbers of total number of reads. Um, but the original abundance counting just will, you know, count reads for each ASV. But that creates a little bit of a bias there because, you know, if you compare a sample that maybe had 10,000 total reads to another sample that had 100,000 total reads, then you might observe that most of the ASVs in the sample with 100,000 total reads is more abundant simply because um, they still have the same relative abundance, but they kind of have a higher total read depth in the sample or higher total read count. Um, and specifically because there isn't really much information contained in that. So you might maybe say, oh, well, one sample has 100,000 reads. Maybe there was more DNA in the sample or there was like more bacteria in the sample total, but that's not really true because the one thing we do before sequencing is usually normalize the amount of DNA. So for every sample, we put in a constant amount of DNA. And all this difference in different reads across samples is actually just an artifact of the sequencing. So it's a very uh, microscopic process that often can happen that certain um, probes just attach better to the sequences than others. And you get those differences in total read counts of current sample, which is not really associated with any real signal. Um, so what we can do is basically to can get around that is we can subsample each sample to, you know, a small amount of reads, which is kind of the, maybe the minimum number of reads that we had for every sample. So we, if we have a sample with 100,000 reads, we just take 10,000 random of reads of those total set of 100,000, and we pull that out and do the analysis with that. Um, that is often called rarefaction, so it kind of you know, subsamples it all so that we have the same total number of reads in each sample. There, you know, for certain statistical analysis, that might not be the best strategy. It works well for like visualizations, like PCOAs and things, but um, there might be also other strategies and we will look at different methods to normalize as well later on. But that's something that we will do here. And then we also pass in a metadata file now, which is the first time we actually do that. So metadata file, like I said, um, includes information about the samples. So in our case, it maps the sample to the community that sample came from and gives some information about where those communities usually get their food from. Um, and that we will use so we can kind of, for instance, um, compare across the geographic regions that we sampled from um, in our later visualizations. And then we generate an output directory for it. Again, that's the same strategy as we did for day um, earlier. So if one of the action generates a lot of different artifacts, we just specify directory and it will just save them all in there. So we can run that. Um, it will not take too long, even though it does go through quite a lot of calculations, like you know, generating all those different metrics, um, the alpha diversity, beta diversity, and so on. And the first thing we could do, for instance, after that is to, and you see all the um, artifacts that are generated by it. Um, the first thing we could do is, for instance, try to you know look at the Shannon. Um, diversity across those. Um, so basically we could take the alpha diversity, which is a single value for each sample. And now we could say like for those samples coming from different communities, how do they compare? Um, and we can look at that by using the alpha group significance 
action from the diversity plugin, which essentially runs the test for that. And I think it runs the man Whitney test by default. And we'll also create like a box plot of the um, Shannon diversity across those groups. So same strategy as before. This was saved into diversity and then alpha groups QCB. So we will look for that folder. We might have to again update it to actually see it. Alpha groups QCB, that's the one I'm going to download and then look at it again with the visualizer from Chime 2. So what we see is, well, the major signal here is that we see our all communities, the alpha diversity is actually pretty high. So uh, above four or something is, you could say that's high alpha diversity for the human gut microbiome sample um, when mapping to the ASV level. And by default, it actually integrated also the metadata table. So those were all columns in the metadata table that we provided. So that's a file that you can generate yourself. Um, and you have the other ones as well, which in this case, they're actually, you know, kind of all different between the groups. So we can't actually distinguish like, um, you know, if some of them are driving more or less of that, um, because like we do see that they're all fairly different. Um, but what we do see that here in that case, the, the samples from the Hatsa community have an exceptionally high alpha diversity. Um, which is also owed to many factors, but also the very um, complex diet. Um, and then we also see, you know, that the other ones also still have fairly high alpha diversity. One thing is, is actually the, what is complicated here is the interpretation aspect of it. It's actually hard to say what that means. Um, so it is even though it's a property of the ecological system, it isn't necessarily connected to any function. So usually you'd actually see more correlations if you would look within a community. So if within a community, you try to correlate alpha diversity of the gut microbiome to certain phenotypic measurements, you might see a signal, but across communities, that's often mostly driven by geographic differences um, and like just different lifestyles and so on. So that's really hard to tease apart in that case, but we do see that there's definitely patterns to it here. And then it might also run um, a statistical test for it. In this case, it's three different groups. Um, so it actually, you can kind of see the pairwise comparisons, but you can also see like, um, um, then the cross curve all is pairwise is just the man Whitney actually. Um, and it will also correct for multiple testing if you wanna see if you know all of them are. In our case, they are fairly, I mean, they're visually very different values and it also assigns a statistical significance to that thing that you know, they seem to be statistically different alpha diversity measures here. Okay, and I can go back to the original one. That's the first thing. Um, so you could also look at um, the permanova analysis that we talked about, which was that very, you know, um, funky method of trying to um, scramble the data and then extracting goodness of fit values and getting p values just from that. So, for instance, you could kind of see if. Again, like even if you look at better diversity, so just looking at, you know, on an ecological scale, um, other samples, there's some gut microbiome composition here and, and that very better diversity scale, like different between different ethnic groups in that example. And if we look at that, you can kind of do the same thing, download that Permanova QZV visualization look at it again. And this sims actually just gives us a table and it tells us how much of the variance is explained. So in this case, it tells us in that better diversity metric, 61% of the total variance is explained just by differences between the different ethnic groups. Um, so that's really a large fraction. The majority of the variance is actually just explained by that, which is, you know, not surprising having um, communities from very different um, locations on the globe. So that's not something that should surprise us here. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like shown here, like, and it also assigns a significant p-value to it. So we do see that, you know, the gut microbiome, like on a very broad ecological comparison scale, there are very different compositions that we see here. And a large fraction of the variance is explained by the grouping into different communities. And it also generates a lot of visualizations by default. Um, so if you look in the diversity folder and you look for files that end in QZV, you see a bunch of them that we didn't really sign with the separate comments that were generated in the beginning as well. Uh, and you see that they're usually prefixed with the name of the distance 
Um, so we did maybe, we might remember that Ray Curtis was a weighted better diversity measure um, that did not take phylogenetic distance into account. We do know that the Unifrac versions do take that into account. So maybe we want to look at one of those. Um, and one thing we might be looking at is a weighted Unifrac. So that was the version that took phylogenetic similarity into account, but also weighted by abundance differences. So kind of incorporates all the information. Um, we could have a look at this one as well, and that will um, look pretty fancy. I'll go back to the viewer again and pull that up here. And feel free to also look at this in way more detail on your own time. So now we kind of see that projection. By default, it actually projects in three dimensions, not in two, but it does align it along the first two. So it actually looks almost like a 2D map, but you can drag it around with your mouse to actually also see the third axis if you wanted to. So um, by default, we, for instance, you can also only look at the first two. We see that the first axis, they're also annotated by the amount of variance in the data explained by single axis only. And you see that a lot of it is explained by the first axis and then a larger fraction by the second. So the sum of both is already pretty high. So we do capture a lot of the variance in those distances. And you do also have that chance here to color those initial points by the data from your metadata. So if you color them by the ethnic group, we actually see, you know, a little bit of a surprising signal here, but um, that actually like there's one sample from the Japan group that actually clusters a little bit with semifar, which have like a um, like large diversity as well here. Um, but in general, we see a tendency that, you know, samples from a particular community tend to cluster with samples from that community, which again is owed to the fact that they're from distinct geographic regions, but we do see that there's also some finer mapping here, and um, that has also a lot, again, to do with, you know, lifestyle and so on, and the way we quantify that. Okay, so that's how we looked at that. Um, interpretation is a little bit harder here. Um, Still, we don't really know what, you know, we, we can see that there may be differences, but it's like another challenge to really see what that means um, and how do we interpret it. And we also have to see that a lot of, you know, the social um, aspects of that when should be considered as well. So, and then that gives us like a very global description of the different samples, but we now might be getting to the question, um, you know, who's really there? So who's at the party, um, who's present in the microbiome um, and try to quantify that as well. So what organisms are present in our samples or how would we do that? So yeah, maybe you can go on this lecture if you have some ideas, so you would usually do that. So the information we have up to now is just what we got from our data two analysis. So we do have the sequences of the individual amplicons, but we don't really cannot map that directly to names. So what would be a strategy there? So what would you do to go from a sequence of an amplicon to an organism's name, essentially, for instance, to be able to tell, oh, that sequence came from E. coli, for instance, or from bacteroides, and so on. And there might be some suggestions. Um, and while those pour in, let's talk a little bit about taxonomic ranks. So usually how that works is that we... In bacteria, it's actually quite complicated to really, you know, group them into distinct clades like that. But in really general terms, what we have is usually we have a taxonomy. Taxonomy is kind of like a hierarchical ordering of namings, um, where names are usually contained in larger groups again, and those groups are contained in other groups. Um, and so a good example of that is like what we usually know when we assign, for instance, species names and genus names, right? A species name is a very specific name. It's not the most specific you can go. The most specific is usually a strain, which means like a unique genome. But then we do know that, you know, most individuals in a species group usually have very low um, genomic di um, divergence. So they're pretty similar on a genomic scale. And then if we go up the taxonomic ranks, we kind of get less and less similar groups. So the genus is a bit more heterogeneous than the family again. So we can have those groups and we use that basically to assign names in a taxonomic system. Um, for amplicon sequencing data, honestly, the lowest of those ranks that we can reliably detect is the genus level. Like within a genus or within a species, the uh, V4 region just doesn't differ enough 
for instance, that we could really detect those reliability. Sometimes you can assign a species to like a few of the ASBs, but that fraction is usually really low. So you might only represent 10% of the total reads in your sample, whereas on the genus level, you get the majority will get a genus assignment. So um, maybe one of the ideas that was mentioned in the chat is that essentially we could look for, you know, what is the actual sequence of the 16S amplicon in a reference genome, right? Like when that organism was sequenced and really well assembled and curated, like we could take the known sequence and compare it to the ones we actually found in our sample and then say if they're very close, maybe that organism is present. That seems intuitive, right? But it doesn't always work well in practice. And why? Well, the reason is mostly because those reference databases might not really, you know, correspond to our organism. Um, so it might actually not have been observed, but there's also, you know, there might have been some divergence. So even though our reference genome was maybe for the lab strain of E. coli, what we actually have in our samples is an E. coli strain that was always living in the human gut. So it's not really the same organism that was, for instance, sequenced in the lab. But we can still kind of use those database of known genes to kind of come up maybe with a slightly smarter way. So instead of saying I want a perfect match to a sequence that I've seen in a reference database, I can ask other characteristics of that reference database sequence. And one idea would be, for instance, that a lot of bacteria adapt, for instance, the usage of um, codons for a particular environment. So the, as we know, is that the genetic code is degenerate, meaning that like different codons of nucleotides can still encode for the same amino acid. And that can kind of create like um, like a strategy, for instance, really basically, if you had some idea, you could base it on that. You could, for instance, ask, okay, um, is the codon usage, for instance, in the 16S variable region different uh, or very specific to specific species? And we can actually generate, generalize that even more. You can just ask, well, if I just look at short subfragments, what does that look like? And that strategy is kind of what's used in a multinomial naive base that sounds super elaborate, but it's actually just that basic idea. So you take a longer sequence and you just um, subdivided in all possible smaller subsequences, and those are often called K-MERS, um, for like a small substring of the sequence with length K. So for instance, a 2-MER would be all um, subsequences with two nucleotides in it, and a 3-MER would essentially be a codon, right, like three nucleotides, and that's kind of shown here as an example. So you can kind of slide over the sequence and just count how often each of those subsequences appear. So for instance, here in that longer sequence, we see we have one ACG, two CGCs, and one GCG. And it turns out that if you take those k and you make a profile out of it, so you kind of say, oh, how likely is that k um to appear in a certain 16S gene from a certain species, for instance, you see that they're very specific. And it's like a little bit more generalizable than just looking at the exact sequence match because it does allow still for that sequence to have diverged a little bit, but it takes into account that, you know, as evolution goes on or as, you know, strains diverge, maybe they usually don't tend to do it too much. So we kind of, observe a lot of that profile is kind of maintained. So what we do from a reference database is we build up that reference model where we kind of have, for instance, two different taxa in the database. Um, I can might take into account that a taxon is very overrepresented in the database. Maybe I see that, you know, I have 15, 16S sequences from E. coli, but only one from bacteroides. Maybe that's something I want to take into account. And then I can kind of build up the frequency or the probability of observing any of those k in that particular sequence. So in the first case, we kind of know that we had like, you know, no one in four chance for an ACG. We have a 50% chance for um, whoop, a CGC actually, sorry, that's kind of turned around here. And then the GCG would be a force as well. Um, but essentially you can kind of count those examples and you can do that for each taxon. You get those profiles the probability distributions of k -mers. But why is that in any way informative? That just tells us how likely it would be to observe a certain k -mer from a given taxon, but we will actually want to do the opposite, right? We want to put in a query sequence and then know what's the probability that that query sequence came from a specific taxon. And that's where the base part in that method comes from. Base is just a really smart way to turn those things around. So if I want to know what the probability is that, um, that a particular query came from a taxon or 
the probability that I was actually observing taxon one given that particular query, then the base theorem says that, oh, you can turn that around. Like as long as you know the probability of a certain query given a certain taxon. And that's exactly our reference model. It tells us that, right? Because it gives us a rule how to calculate that probability by basically going through those individual ones. Because if I have my full sequence, it would be exactly that. What's the probability of the query given its taxon one? And that's calculated basically. What's the probability of just observing the taxon, even though methods might differ here and into taking that into account or just saying that the probability of observing any taxon is uniform? Um, and then it, well, that would be the probability of observing one ACG, right? and observing two CGCs and observing one GCG because those were exactly the camus in the sequence. And an end and probability usually means multiplication. So you can just multiply those out and you get a total probability um, just calculated from the PQT part. Then there is that probability of T part here still in the formula and also the probability of serving a query. Usually we just say we don't really know the probability of serving a certain sequence, but we will just assume that they're all kind of equally probable. Then we can just kind of not consider this part that much, like because we kind of know that still if the part up here um, is kind of maximized, then it doesn't really matter what happens in the denominator. So that is kind of what we do. There's also like more general methods. You can use any machine learning methods based on KMERS because they just give you a profile and you could classify on that. But the multinomial naive base function works really well. So and it provides a bit, bit better generalization because instead of matching exact sequences or something, it kind of takes those parts of the, uh, takes just that does prevalence of certain chemos into account, which is a bit more stable in most cases. It also allows you, for instance, to classify sequences that you might not have been observed in a reference database. It might, for instance, tell you, oh, well, I'm pretty sure that sequence is coming from this particular order, even though I can't really assign a genus. So you can kind of do things like that, even with sequences that haven't been observed. So without further ado, let's just go and actually run the taxonomy classification. The way that works is that you usually have already like um, a classifier that has been trained on a reference database. Um, there are many of those available. Um, the largest one is probably the Silver database, which is a reference database that only contains um, 16S genes. Um, and that contains a lot of organisms because for many organisms, you might not have a full reference genome, but you might have this 16S sequence. So, um, But we will be using a bit more like a reduced data set here, which is still working really well for most cases and also will interface better with what we do tomorrow, which is the NCBI RefSeq database, which is basically just the database of um, any organism that has like a full reference genome in the NCBI database that's well curated. Um, and it will also work better in the Google Colab setup. So basically that's the reference model. And then we just apply the base theorem essentially to find out what is the taxon with the highest probability given those particular input ASV sequence. And that's what we get. So for each ASV, we get like a taxonomic assignment attached to it. And that will take a little bit, but not too long. It's a fairly straightforward job. Um, we use the classify scikit-learn uh, action from the feature classifier plugin. Like I said, what it now needs is the actual ASV sequences and data to did generate those and they're contained in artifact called representative sequences. We use our NCBI RefSeq. That was kind of um, trimmed at the genus level, like I said, because that's the finest level you can reliably identify and was actually trained also only on that subsequence that corresponds to our amplified regions. So it, you kind of see the primer pair that we used here appearing again. So that gives a little bit of higher um, sensitivity than for instance, using the full 16 S gene, because that would also take into account the V1 regions, or also conserved regions, but we actually only do it on that particular fragment. So then we get like a taxonomic assignment. And that kind of for the first time allows us to actually look at like, you know, not only which particular bacterial taxa were present in the individual samples, but also how much of each of those taxa were present. And we do that by basically combining that information of the assignments of taxa with the abundances we get from TADA2 and generating a visualization, which is a bar plot. And that is in the taxa 
plugin and the Ziba plot action, it takes as an input two things, the abundance table, we got an individual for the ASVs, and then also the tax assignments, so the taxonomic assignments for the ASVs that we now generated. Again, we put in our metadata as well, that kind of annotates the samples a little bit, and we get a visualization out, which is, well, we will see how that looks like. We might have to update it. Um, it should appear in the top level of the materials directory. So you should see that tax of upload file here. We can download that. In the same procedure as before. Oops, clicking at the wrong thing, but then pulling it up here. So now we kind of see for each of our samples, we see it. And by default, it takes like the highest taxonomic level. Um, in here won't necessarily tell you what's like the kingdom and so on. You can kind of infer it because it prefixes it in front of the name. So here we see the key, the kingdom. Usually the V4 region is very specific to bacteria. It doesn't really do a great job of detecting archaea, but there is a few archaea that can be identified based on that if they're present in the database. We see that like for one of the samples from the MEFA, we do see like a certain relative abundance of archaea, even though there's probably more in other samples as well that just wasn't detected here because it's not really great in getting to here out. But we can also reduce that. For instance, we could look at the phylum level, which is usually you know, a good indicator initially to look at because you kind of know that um those are not too many groups so we can still color them well on a bar plot um and you can also sort samples by for instance uh, ethnic groups that were sampled from so we kind of get them a bit nicely grouped and we do see again that also here we see quite some differences um and actually so in those communities, you might see that, you know, a lot of things that you might have heard maybe from, you know, the typical European and North American populations doesn't necessarily extrapolate well to like those samples from communities that are not really um, represented well in the existing literature. For instance, you do see actually large abundances um, of Firmicutes and the Hatsa. But the Hatsa still live on a mostly very plant-based diet. Um, meat isn't really that often consumed in the Hatsa communities, um, which is, you know, like it, often you hear rules like, oh, high firmicutes is for high meat consumption or something. But it, it, it does tell us there's many ways to assemble an ecological system or an ecosystem like in the human gut. And a lot of the rules don't really necessarily extrapolate well into um, communities that are understudied. Um, we do see that those, even on the phylum level, we do see quite some differences across the different populations. Um, again, due to many reasons. Um, so there's definitely quite some heterogeneity going on here. And you might map that even to finer levels. You could look, for instance, at the finest levels that we have here is the genus level. You can kind of see that, for instance, um, like the, some of the Chipang and Mefa samples have a lot of high Prevotella abundances, um, which is kind of almost dominating here the microbiome. Whereas like um, the Hatsa samples, you see really like consistent with that alpha diversity measure we observe. We also see that, you know, they have a huge variability of different bacterial genera that live in their guts. So that gives us like an information who is there. Um, one thing you might want to compare is you might want to, you know, say, okay, what if I take my abundances that were mapped on the amplicon sequencing variant, um, variant level and kind of want to collapse it maybe on like a higher taxonomic rank. So that's kind of what we saw here with the relative abundances in the bar plot. For instance, if I collapse on the phylum level, I see that particular percentage of Fermicutus, for instance. Um, you can also do that and generate that data. And one of the last things we might want to do is kind of, you know, also show an example how you get that data out. So usually a lot of those taxonomic abundances or like on different ranks is something that we might want to use for different downstream analysis. Maybe there is nothing available in Chime 2 that does the particular analysis that you want to run. Maybe you want to run a particular statistical model or, you know, do, use a different programming language language maybe you have to like some r scripts to analyze it and want to do that um and that is something that we could definitely do and we will show some examples so here's like a few examples here so we can kind of do um like a collapsing and kind of take the abundance data that we had from the other two um and kind of collapse it on the genus level for instance 
actually I see that it's using the treasure chest data here. You could also remove the treasure chest part. It, it will give exactly the same output. It's just, you could also run it just like that. Just the taxa and the other two tables that you generated in your run. Um, and it will generate a new artifact, which are now the abundance it just collect on the genomes level. That actually doesn't necessarily, it doesn't do any rarefaction or things like that or calculate relative abundances. So it still has original read counts, which might be good if, you know, your particular statistical methods actually want that data input. And then we'd also do an example here, which is like a two-step process that actually pulls out the actual data. So that's still an artifact. And I did tell you it's like basically a zip file, so you could go and rename it, but there's also tools to directly export it. So one thing we can do is we can go into the, can use a um, plugin called tools again, which we used to initially import the data. It also has an export function, but it basically goes into an artifact and pulls out the actual data. So we can run that. Um, and then the first thing that would do is only, you know, pull out the particular data format that is here, which looks a bit odd in our case. So what we will see is if we look at that in our exported folder now, is that it generated a file called dot biome, which is nothing we would be able to look at. It's like kind of a very compressed version of those very large abundance tables, but we can kind of add in a tool, like basically there is a tool that comes with Chime 2, which is called Biome, and that actually can convert that table in that compressed format to something you kind of know, and we will output it to a tab separated file, which is just, you know, something we can read with almost any other tool, and that's what we did here. So we also have that genus TSV table, you could kind of look at it, and kind of what it does is it now combines those information, so you kind of get the taxonomic information down to the genus level, and then you get the read counts in every single sample. So you could say that, you know, in the first Chepang sample, we had 3,697 reads that were mapped to Prevotella genus, for instance. So that you can actually plug in into any analysis that you wish, right? Um, because basically any programming language has a package to read TSV files. So it's like a very common format. And without like really understanding everything that's going on in the next fragment of code, that will walk through, you through it to it, but you don't really need to be like a total expert in Python or what packages to use. It's just to give you an example, like how you can use that data and kind of use it without kind of maybe using Chime specifically. So. That's actually a bunch of Python code here. I don't really have to prefix it with the exclamation mark because by default, Jupyter just executes Python code. So I use like a bunch of packages here. Um, maybe the important ones here are pandas in this case, which is just a package that can read basically data frame format the data from a lot of different formats, including TSV files. We have Seaborn, which is a plotting library to do a lot of different visualizations. So we kind of use that pandas here to, for instance, first read the table, which gives us like a data frame. Um, and we can do a lot of stuff with that. Like a lot of helper functions, pandas. One thing is we could, for instance, um, split this kind of longer string. So if you remember that what it looked like, we have all those assignments here down from the kingdom level down to the genus level. So what we could kind of do is if we want to reduce that a little bit, Let's assume we only want the genus level. So we only want, for instance, the Prevotella part here. So we could kind of split it on the semicolons and also strip away the leading genus identifier, the G underscores, because then we know we already extracted the genus. That's kind of what the code here does. We can also remove ASV sequence that did not have a genus assignment. Like I said, those databases can generalize, but they might not be able to map to really low ranks. So if they're very low, not a lot of representatives of the specific genus in the database, or the particular sequence that you found isn't really represented well by those, then you might actually not see an assignment on the genus level. So we kind of remove those as well that have like an empty genus entry. So that either start with two underscores have like G or two underscores. Those usually mean there's no assigned genus. Um, we can, for instance, take 50 random genera from that set. And just because, you know, we, we want to be super elaborate, like instead of, for instance, using a rarefaction, we can use a different form of a normalization method, which is called a centered log ratio transform. It, sounds super complex, but it essentially means is your log transforms the data and then you subtract the mean from the log of the data. Um, what that does is basically it also kind of takes out a little bit that 
library size, so the, the amount of different reads across the samples, because like you could assume that this is just a random thing that like, makes everything more abundant in a sample with more reads, and that will be basically removed by that technique. There's also a lot of like tech. There's a lot of technical or theoretical region why that is a good transform. It's also really good for things that sum up to a particular sum. So you usually know that all the relative abundances sum up to 100%. Um, it kind of removes like spurious correlations a little bit that can appear because of that. But yeah, it's a different way to normalize it just. And you could use any other method that you see fit here. Just an example how you transform the data into something that is now, you know, a log transformed abundance minus the mean log transformed abundance. And it's applied to each single sample here. So essentially what that new normalized data mean is means is if we see a value of zero, it means that's basically as abundant as the average thing in that sample. If it would be negative, it means that particular genus is less abundant than the average. Uh, if it would be positive, it means it's more abundant than the average. So it's kind of still has that information of what is like high and low abundance in the encoded, but kind of normalized. So you can actually compare a bit better between different samples. And then we can use like a really fancy heat map function from the Seaborn thing that kind of like draws like an informative heat map that shows us in each sample, which are those 50 genera and how abundant are they at the same time? And like, if we run that, it will create that particular custom visualization for you. And you could like tune that with different things. So basically what it will tell you now is, and that's here, like the, the ID of the particular um, genus. And then here you kind of have the different samples. So you can look at a particular genus in a sample and we'll kind of color them by the abundance going from very dark uh, towards kind of like a high yellowish orange color for very abundant things. So for instance, here in that sample, we see that Fecali bacterium is pretty abundant in all of those samples, but with quite some differences across different samples, right? Um, and you do kind of, so that plot will look very different for each of you because essentially it creates a run, random subset, which will, you know, come out as something different for all of you. So you will look, every one of you will have a very custom plot, their own personal um, list of genera that they're kind of analyzing here. But what you will all see is that there are always those patterns of some of those genera kind of present in all of the samples. So they are very ubiquitous, but then you will see some genera that are very specific, sometimes even for a single sample. So they only appear there in really high abundances. Um, you will see that some of them appear in a particular group. So in a particular ethnic group, you will see that genus pop up with a slightly higher abundance. And then some of them might, you know, have like kind of like a hybrid pattern, which appear maybe in two groups, but not in the other and things so on. Um, so you can kind of extract some of those patterns from there. And you kind of see that there's really a lot of um, heterogeneity in terms of like, you know, how ubiquitous a certain genus appears. We do know that there's like a few of the taxa that probably appear in most human microbiomes, even though it's something we can't really, really say with certainty yet, because honestly, we haven't seen enough of uh, the human microbiome on a global scale yet. Um, but we definitely see that this is also because of those patterns that are very specific to specific ethnic groups that can also sometimes create like certain misrepresentations of things because if I kind of base all my research on a particular genus that only appears, for instance, in people from the US, then this is obviously not going to be particularly useful for communities where the, they don't even have that particular taxon they got at all. So, um, so like that's kind of an argument to look at that more. There is a caveat to that here, though. Um, the fact that we can assign a name to an ASB doesn't really mean it's the same organism. Um, and that's something I want you to look at in that exercise section here that will be, you can do on your own time. Um, essentially, since we now have the taxonomic assignment, we can come back to the kind of the beginning where we had that phylogenetic tree of the original amplicon variances. And you will be able now to annotate that tree with those annotated genera, for instance, and kind of see, okay, if we look at the amplicons extracted from that genus, are they really like very really similar? Um, do we see that, you know, they appear across all populations or not? Um, and you would see there's quite some signals there. And yeah, I'll, I would like you to go through that a little bit, um, maybe reflect on that a little bit. What does that mean? What does it mean if we have high divergence? Um, 
between different amplicons or between different organisms in the same class of genus, even across populations. Like there might be, you know, certain things we should be careful with then in that case. Um, and it kind of also shows that, you know, this view of maybe wanting to put names on it, it's really, you know, it's very intrinsic to us because we, we like to, you know, make statements based on that. And for instance, um, you see in the literature a lot of like that, Bacteroid D is from EQ ratios, um, which are associated with a bunch of things, um, apparently. But then, like often, that kind of can kind of lose that strain heterogeneity or the divergence, evolutionary speaking, that has occurred there. Like, you know, those bacteria have lived in very different environments. Um, so that's kind of um, something you might want to look at as well in on your own. And you have also some space here to do add in any other analysis. You can go through the Chime 2 plugins and maybe look at a certain particular analysis that you want to do as well. Um, and yeah, that's it for actually the material for today um, in terms of the course. Um, we will still be having an amazing talk by Ajish Jha um, after that. Um, we'll have some time for some Q&A here right now, but just to reiterate, um, yeah, go through, annotate that phylogenetic tree now with the taxa, the abundances, the samples, all the metadata, which will create like also some quite nice visualizations. You will be able to dig in, dig in very much in detail um, what's happening to particular ASVs across different communities. So that's something to look at maybe. Um, and there's yeah a lot to learn from that as well. And also to tease maybe a little bit what will be happening tomorrow. Another question is, even if you would observe the exact same organism or the same microbe in two different, um, you know, the gut of two different individuals, would they actually behave the same? Because we know that microbes, you know, are very adept at reacting to changes in the environment. So like almost all bacteria have different ways of to obtain carbon or nitrogen and to translate that into biomass. But that will also kind of change what how they act in that environment, for instance, which metabolites are produced as a side effect of that. Um, so one question would be if you had exactly the same organism, but would it put it into the gut of people that live very different lifestyles or live in different communities, would the functional output or how that particular microbe acts actually be the same or might it be really different? And that's something that Nick will be talking a lot tomorrow and will show some really cool approaches and how to do that, even when you have only limited data available. So that's just a little teaser for what's going on tomorrow. And I hope that, yeah, you will have some fun with that as well. Um, yeah, apologies for if I went too fast with certain parts. Um, but yeah, there's also the Slack channel. So if anything seems unclear, feel free to write it there. That Slack channel will be open for a long time, even after the course ends. Um, so even if you see that it's in a video recording right now, feel free to ask questions there still. And I will be there as well and answering questions. And yeah, happy to receive any feedback that you have as well. And with that, um, I just want to also thank like all the people that participated in the course and Sean kind of alluded to that as well. But just the fact that you just saw my face now, maybe more than you wanted to, um, does not mean that this like the course material or any of the things that you did today were, you know, just designed by one person. A lot of different people um, were involved in creating all those teaching materials and making it accessible. Um, and then there's also a huge, huge, huge amount of work that went into just making this uh, event work to kind of, you know, providing live streaming, setting up like the TAs here, um, you know, in our meeting room, um, organizing the events, managing registrations, and so on. So I just want to give a shout out uh, specifically also to Dominic, um, who is the event and manager here at the ISB and did a lot of, you know, work behind the scenes to make this work so smoothly, but also like a lot of the ISB team here that has worked like tirelessly to make this like work so well over the years as well. So thanks too much also like to you joining us today and yeah. I think we have like a few minutes for some, you know, major Q and A questions if something popped up. So, feel free to post them in Slack. Yeah, so the, I think one that came up was this controversy about her actually. Yes. What are your thoughts on? Oh yeah, that's a that's a big topic for sure. Um, yeah, there's a lot of arguments to be made about it. So. Um, and I'm not even sure if I'm the best person to make them, but yeah, one 
one of the things that can be said about rarefaction is that since you randomly subsample, you often generate one random sample, which can just mean that, you know, by bad luck, you might just pick out, you know, a lot of reads from a particular taxon from like a larger set of reads, and that can kind of skew your results a little bit. So like every time you run the rarefaction analysis, your results might look slightly different. And you can actually see that in the course yourself. If you just rerun the phylogenetic, like core phylogenetic steps, like the data visualization, which looks slightly different based on that subsampling. Um, then there is an argument to be made of, you know, leaving out data, right? If you subsample a sample with 100,000 reads to 10,000, you leave out 90% of the sample. That's just what happens. So that does not mean that what you extracted is not representative of the sample, but that question is there. So a lot of discussion is going in that. So um, I think it's... Yeah, I think the important thing is that you're very, um, you know, if you write it up in your paper or something, be definitely very vocal about what you did, what you normalized, and be aware that there might be like effects of that as well that are not really a signal in the data. There's different methods to normalize as well. They make certain assumptions, which might or might not be true for your particular samples that you have. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of literature on that as well. And we can maybe like post a few resources on Slack. I, I would say yes, but I wouldn't really say, I'm not sure if we're really at a point where we're completely decided in the field <laughs> what, what it is. I do think that for like, right, just for visualizations, like doing the PCOAs plots and so on, it might work pretty well. Like there, you, you do see that it, you know, kind of works, but there's also alternatives, yes. But yeah, sorry, I don't really have a real definitive answer for that. I wonder if any of this, what do you think about the new tax on like the English students? That's a little term. <laughs> what do um, I think? Might be yeah, complicated. Uh, yeah, okay, the question was like, what do we think about the renaming and the new naming scheme? So yeah, again, it's, um, Obviously, it's hard to remember what tax to do just based on the name. So, like I argued, like sometimes the name isn't also that informative, anyways, right? And the end strains from a particular genus might act very different in different environments. And so it's like hard to really assign function just based on a name. Um, even though it makes it harder to maybe recognize things you've seen before. But I think a lot of that is also done to kind of get more consistency in how we do taxes. So kind of getting monophyletic groups. So meaning like getting really distinct naming schemes based on groups that really have one common ancestor. And as more data is coming in, those change, right? And what we first considered, for instance, one Prevotella genus might actually make sense to subdivide it into five different genera because they, we actually see that's a lot of divergence happening. So I think it will be always the case that taxonomic naming evolves as more data comes in because essentially those trees, like we did it in our case, are generated from genomic data. They're not really generated from six, just a small 16S fragment. They use a larger amount of like very conserved proteins. But yeah, I think it, it's something we, we will have to live with that those names tend to change. Um, but yeah, then if you really want to get around it, you can you know analyze everything on the strain level and then it's all their own. Okay, I think if there's no other pressing question, we can actually take that time for a little bit of a longer break before I think we have gone through quite some material. So everybody can, you know, um, relax a little bit and recharge. And like I said, if you have any questions, please ask them on Slack. We'll be happy to answer. And if you're taking that course later on, then yeah, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, and also feel invited to still send in questions, even that's like a week after the course has ended.